We are encountering Jesus from Luke, and this week we're looking at part one of two. This is items, uh, times in Luke where people were sick and they sought out Jesus, or they were sick and Jesus sought them out, and how that encounter changed their life. Now next week is what happens if somebody in your life is sick, but they can't get to Jesus? What about when others are sick? How do you encounter Jesus on their behalf? And so there's items in Luke that go both ways. So there was enough incidents to be able to split that into a two-group set. Anybody have any aches, pains, ailments at all? Any physical struggles? That's life. You know, we could ask, we could save. And you put up your hand, yep. Back ache, neck ache. Even though Saskatchewan boys got aches and pains, right? Sports ache, what do you call that? <laughs> our physical and our spiritual connect. And so here's some quotes I want you to see how you connect. It is no longer a question of staying healthy, it's a question of finding a sickness you like. <laughs> So doesn't it get to that point in the medication where, okay, what side effect? Might not be able to get rid of it, but lesser of evils. Health is not valued till sickness comes. Now that one happens to be by a clergyman. This morning I had a phone call to say, there's somebody that's in hospice that wants somebody to pray for them. Can you come to the hospice to pray for them? Why now? What about that time in life that says, maybe I need this? It happens. It's not appreciated, not valued till sickness comes. You know that decline and the change that it can make. And then this one, my relationship with my body was changed. I used to consider it a servant who should obey, function, give pleasure. In sickness, you realize that you're not the boss. It's the other way around. Had malaria once. Don't know if you heard the story. It's the boss. You can't tell that stuff nothing. It does not listen. It's the boss. That can be the way that it is. You think you're in control, but then you're not. Now, as we were talking in class, now get context. Now get situational. We're looking at Luke. Luke himself is a doctor. But what do you do with a medical system like that? What hope do you have if not for Jesus? Were people sick back then? Yeah. Did they seek out Jesus when they were sick? They did. And those encounters we can read because it is human nature when we're struggling with something beyond our control to seek out Jesus. And sickness is one of those. The truth of the series is encountering Jesus changes lives. We know that in our own lives and we want to be able to share that truth with others because they're seeking Jesus even if they know it or not. And sickness is one of those areas where people may really start to seek Jesus and they hadn't before. Physical and spiritual impact of being sick and therefore wanting to connect, to find some hope. But these aren't just stories of stories. I want us to walk a mile in their shoes. I want us to think about what it would have been like to be in that day and age in that medical situation. We tend to complain, criticize the medical system we're under. But what about back then? So to personalize it, I find dealing with sickness or frailty can make me feel... Anybody want to answer that one? Janice, I see you saying it. Go ahead. Own it. Helpless. I find dealing with sickness or frailty can make me feel... Old. <laughs> You're not alone. When you struggle, it is a struggle. Dealing with sickness and frailty can make me feel... Isolated, embarrassed, abandoned, 
Concerned? Fearful? Angry? How about joyful? Exuberant? Passionate? Because we think, hey, I got to die of something. <laughs> Times of physical suffering impact me spiritually by. Perhaps the lady who wants prayer is feeling thoughtful. That's right. Sometimes sickness and frailty can make you thoughtful, make you prioritize. Mindful, tap into that what the busyness in life tries to avoid. Times of physical suffering impact me spiritually by disconnection from the church, can't attend services, being alone, people don't connect with you when you're suffering. It can impact us spiritually because that's what you've got to focus on, so your energy is not necessarily in taking care of the spiritual. And other people at other times, the physical suffering says, no, the spiritual is number one. So just depending, you can vacillate between those two extremes. Highly connected to God and highly disconnected. When those in my life who do not have Jesus get sick or face the idea of mortality, they tend to. And what's the difference? Not a lot of hope. They tend to struggle. Fear. This is a reality of life. And if you didn't have Jesus, then what? Then what? We're reading encounters where people heard of Jesus able to do something and then did everything they could to go to him, to be with him. And what he was able to do is miraculous. God understands the connection and impact of the physical and spiritual. And Luke's gospel has several encounters with Jesus by those that were suffering in sickness. Next week is, but what if they weren't actually seeking? What if you knew that they needed Jesus? What if you were their hope? What do you do when you're the one petitioning God? See, those are two related accounts. What impact did an encounter with Jesus have on those that were suffering in sickness? Because it's significant. So we're going to look at these passages. A number of them we've looked at. So we'll go through pretty quickly. Just noticing the physical impact or the impact on the physical and spiritual. So we're going to go through them uh, as they occur and by topic. So in Luke 4, 31 through 37, Jesus enters the synagogue in Capernaum. Remember, he wasn't well received in his hometown. He goes to Capernaum and he speaks there. He walks in and there's a man possessed by an evil spirit. The evil spirit, as soon as Jesus answers, it seems, the spirit says, I like this one, Ha! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The Spirit spoke through the person. The encounter with Jesus in verse 35, he says, Be quiet. Jesus said sternly, Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. So let's look at this a couple different ways. How would you feel about the level of lost control because of a demon inside? Did he choose what to say? Did he choose to get thrown down? In the passage, it impacts his speech and throws him down. In what ways do you think life was different for the person after the encounter and the demon was removed? Imagine it. Immediately, it all changed. Thankful. At peace, like that conflict gone? How do you think the impact it impacted him physically? Well, he was back in control. How did that impact him spiritually? We don't know. But these encounters, one moment, Jesus saying one thing, and phew, it changed. Demon encounters are... There's a number of them that we read in Luke. Remember Legion? We talked about Legion that we don't know his name, but that was one, a demon. What about having a legion of demons inside you? What kind of lack of control there? 
after those demons are removed, he wants to go with Jesus, but he's left behind to tell how much God has done for you. And he did it all over town. Do you see the passion, the level of his encounter, what he could really say, what, how he could describe what his life was like to be full of demons all vying for control, that idea, and then to be released? The power of his message. The remo removal of a demon seems like a huge impact to both physical and spiritual health. And without Jesus, what hope did they have? Once you had been possessed, you were probably stuck for the rest of your days. How would that hopeless state impact you? The other side is, if you heard Jesus could do something, what would you do to be with Jesus? These encounters changed immediately. You got to catch up on my notes here. Are you familiar with Luke eleven fourteen? And you say to yourself, "Of course, I just memorized that this week." We have an interesting verse, and I want to bring this up because of demon possession. In Luke eleven fourteen, it brings up something that I find to be an interesting thought. It says Jesus was driving out a demon. We've read that before, but what does it say? Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke. And the crowd was amazed. <coughs> Wait a second. Are you saying that there are demons that can take and give you a physical malformity? He wasn't mute. Demon possessed, now he is mute. Demon removed, he's no longer mute. What about legion? Did any of those have that type of... It gets me questioning. What about... Did all demons have this? Did some demons? The demon was mute. Interesting passage to me. It's not the only one that says that the physical came from a spiritual. Can you imagine the impact of being possessed by a demon and then it changing your life physically. Not only do you have the demon inside imp impacting you, probably mentally, but impacting you, changing you physically. Now what about the impact when Jesus breaks the bonds and that impact's removed? And not only do you have the freedom of having control of your body back, but the ailment is gone. Once you knew that your hopeless healing was in Jesus, what would you do to encounter him? How about anything? Wouldn't you? Realistically, I asked you if you had any ailments, pains, aches. If you know Jesus could immediately remove that, isn't it worth a little encounter? Yeah. Once you encountered him, would you keep the secret to yourself? My own little private physician? Or would you share that truth with others? Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Our next encounter, Luke 13, another possession. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled. Now notice what it says. Verse 11. How was she crippled? By a spirit. How long has she been crippled? She's been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. For 18 years. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up. And what's the next part? And praise God. One day you're not crippled up. And then a demon enters. Or a spirit here. The spirit hunches you over and for 18 years you can't straighten up. When you get to straighten up, don't you praise God? Yep. Well, it didn't necessarily demon, but verse 16 says Satan had kept her bound for 18 long years. 
This seems to be a physical impact of a spiritual possession. And her physical life changed. So that may get you wondering, well, what, what about demon possession? Is illness today demon possession? Is some illness today demon possession? Bigger topic than what we have time, but I'll give you the short answer. In my view, this is one of the many changes that occurs after the resurrection of Jesus. At that time, the power of God is released with the Holy Spirit, and the powers of Satan are limited with one of the limits, in my understanding of how this occurs, being the end of demon possession by the end of about the first century. We don't have miraculous gifts, the laying on of hands. Those types of things seem to cease. Demon possession ceases. But it doesn't mean that Satan was completely removed from the scene. Satan exists. Demons still help in his plan. They still exist. But their power is limited because of Jesus' resurrection. That's related to an amillennial or nunce millennial view. And you can have a right to look at that differently, but that's how I see it. Their limited ability now to watching and influencing. But here's the warning. When you invite demons in, they can have influence. If you don't want God in your life and you invite demons, negative spirits, you're giving permission and God respects choice. So it doesn't mean that d demons are powerless, but it is, in my view and understanding of it, and we could talk about that at length, something that's connected to the resurrection. How about leprosy? Ever hear of that one? Would that have been a great condition in the, in the Bible? No, hopeless again. Hopeless without without miraculous cure. It was regarded not only as an impurity. In the Hebrew Bible, leprosy was usually viewed as God's punishment for sinful behavior. So if you had leprosy, well, it's because God's punishing you. If God's punishing you, why would I not do God's plan and just punish you more is what usually happened to lepers. Leprosy was associated with death, and people perceiving it were referred to as the living dead. You're not dead yet, but you're going to be. And that's how you were treated in society. It was socially devaluing condition with serious social consequence. It was a very isolating because you were excluded from community so that you didn't infect community, but you were then disconnected from family or anybody else. Contact with lepers had to be avoided. Lepers had to warn others, if you were in public, to not come near them. So can you imagine living with that, of announcing your ailment every time that you walk to anywhere? Do you think you would feel a part of community or a sense of belonging? What about if leprosy was removed? How is that going to change your life? Does leprosy exist today? Yes. Yes. Oh, we know it. We know more about it. And so, according to the CDC website, it's called Hansen's disease, also known as leprosy, is the specific. It's an infection caused by slow-growing bacteria, Mycobacterium leprae, and it can affect the nerves, skin, eyes, and lining of the nose. With early diagnosis and treatment, the disease can be cured. People with Hansen's disease can continue to work and lead an active life during and after treatment. Leprosy was once feared as a highly contagious and devastating disease, but now we know it doesn't spread as easily and that treatment can be very effective. However, if left untreated, the nerve damage can result in crippling of hands, feet, paralysis, blindness. It can lead to the cutting off of blood cells, which leads to the death of limbs. It can still be a devastating disease and it usually is in impoverished countries. Scientists currently think it may happen when a person with Hansen's disease coughs or sneezes and a healthy person breathes in the droplets containing a bacteria because it's a bacteria that's spread. But it's not a one contact will get you. Close contact with someone untreated leprosy requires many months. And so, yeah, the isolation was important, but if you walked by a leper, you weren't necessarily going to get leprosy. If you lived with a leper, you probably would. And that's what, how we understand it today. But this is a biblical disease that still occurs. So what might an encounter with Jesus be like if you had leprosy? 
Well, we have a few of those. When Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. Now, the Greek uses leprosy as not just Hansen's disease, but any scaly skin disease. You could have psoriasis and be called a leper, like eczema and be called a leper. It didn't have to be leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell to his face on the ground and begged him, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me what? What's the word there? Clean. And do you see the difference in saying you could make me healed, whole? But he uses the word clean because of the isolation. It refers to both aspects, clean of the disease and interconnected. Then Jesus ordered him, he heals him. Right? The, the leprosy immediately leaves him. Verse 13. Jesus reached out his hand, touched the man, I am willing. He said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Immediately. Done. Then he ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifice that Moses commanded for your cleansing and a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him, and be healed of their sickness. What's Jesus' reply or response to this uptick in crowds of people coming to him? They say they're there to heal him, but I'm going to ask you a question about how many were there to hear, and who do you think was there for the healing? His response was he often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. There is a physical impact on Jesus, outpouring. It says power came from him. Verse 13, the group of ten stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. So we're up to Luke 17. He's outside of Jerusalem in Judea, Samaria. These are people that are not considered uh, worthy of healing or the good news. In verse 14, Jesus has ten lepers in 13 say, have pity on us. In verse 14, he saw them. He said, go show yourselves to the priests. And that act of faith, going to show themselves to the priests, and as they went, they were cleansed. Not as, even as they arrived. As they went, they were cleansed. So we know the story. What happens to the ten lepers? Evangelists like Legion? One comes back. In verse 15, it's noted that only one came back to praise God in a loud voice. It says what he did. He threw himself at Jesus' feet, and he was a outcast, right? He was a Samaritan, the other Samaritan we read of that had an impact, who ended up being commended for his faith. But ten were healed, and to be healed of leprosy is no small thing. It should, that encounter should have changed their life. But they accepted the healing and went on. In Luke 6, 17 through 19, we read, he had come to hear and be healed of their disease. This is the Sermon on the Plain, on the level place. But people had come to hear and be healed of their disease. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured. And the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing a good majority of them. Almost 40%. 15 tops. How many people did Jesus heal? Any disease he couldn't take? Any demon he couldn't cast out? You see why crowds came to Jesus. What other hope did you have? I would do anything to be there. His ability to remove evil spirits and heal sickness was unlimited. Jesus was able to heal them all. He was able to. In that day and age, with the limits of medicine, would you be more likely seeking a teacher? Or would you more likely actually be seeking a healing? A healer who could heal any disease. And what might you do once you've been healed? You've lived in infirmity 18 years, hunched over. You've been possessed by a demon. Once you get that freedom back, now what? Do you just go on living your life? The life that you have been denied because of sickness? Well, people do that. We know it because it still happens today.
In verse 19 in that passage, we read of people trying to touch Jesus and that power was coming out from him. That's an important part in our Luke 8, 42 through 48 passage. He's touched by a woman who has been subject to bleeding for 12 years. But because she was subject to bleeding, she was also considered unclean, untouchable. That's a socially, socially isolating view as well. Verse 48 says, In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. But there's a public proclamation. She says, I've been healed to the crowd. He says, you have been healed and sends her away. That is enough to restore her back to her community. So not only was there physical healing, but social and spiritual healing as well. He restored a woman that had been separated from her community for 12 years. She was now able to be with her family and her loved ones and not be impure and making everything else impure. It's a big change, not just the physical. This picture's for Rick. That's not he'd like it the most. Luke 22, 49 through 51, the last healing is what one? Somebody did a Van Gogh here. Who lost an ear? Malchus. Malchus. Is that from Luke? <laughs> the passage is here. When Jesus' followers saw that he was going to happen, he said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. So what's happening to Jesus at this time? Oh, by the way, he's being arrested. He told them, we don't need swords. They said, we'll bring one. What happens when you bring a gun? Somebody's going to get shot. What happens when you bring a sword? Somebody's going to lose their ear. And although this was a person of the high priest who had come to arrest, Jesus just heals, touches that ear, puts it back touches your ear and puts it back. He did this as he's being arrested. John 18, 10, and 11 tells us that his servant's name was Malchus, and the one who had the sword was? Peter's the sword swinger. Just after this in Luke, Peter goes on to the denials. But that gets me thinking, what happened to Malchus? Did he ever come to Jesus? Did he, what did he do after this? Why do we even know his name in Luke or in John? Maybe something did happen. And he has a testimony unlike others. We don't know. What I want us to see in all of these is that people sought Jesus because they needed hope. Do you seek encounters with Jesus in sickness? When you're sick yourself, how does that impact your time with God? How does your health impact your faith and the other way around? How does your faith impact changes in your health? Who do you know that's struggling with their health that needs an encounter with Jesus to change their lives? Maybe he'll even change their health. These accounts that we have in Luke, they were immediately healed. And can you even imagine that? Imagine the disease, the, the ailments, the difficulties that you have. One touch, one word by Jesus, and they're gone. Amazing. Who do you know that really needs Jesus, especially as they're dealing with the thought of mortality or the loss of health? If you happen to be blessed and you're not struggling with health issues, to whom do you direct your praise? This is also a time to be thankful to God that it's not that bad and that I am doing okay. And how are you spiritually pre prepared when difficulties in health do come? Because one of the blessings of age is age. One of the curses of age is aging. So the older you get, as Dick has said, original equipment's best and that changes. You are going to have struggles in health at some time in some way in life. Everybody you know is going to struggle with health in some time and in some way. This is a way that we can help people encounter Jesus. What if they're not seeking Jesus, but you are? 
What if it's somebody that is struggling and you know the hope that they need? What encounters do we read in Luke where other people sought out Jesus to help loved ones? What do we learn from that lesson? We'll get to that next week.